Okay, so here we go. So it is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce this afternoon's colloquium speaker, Professor John Brennan. So John has been on our faculty since 2012. And during those 10 years, he has put together a, what is really an exciting program in neurolinguistics and has established a very active computational neurolinguistics lab. So it's obvious from the one sentence I've already given that John is a neurolinguist, but his research is also important for psycholinguistics, for linguistic theory, and for cognitive science more broadly. So John studies the, the mental structures and computational processes that underlie language comprehension. And his work aims to specify both the processes involved in mapping the auditory or visual input to mental representations of meaning, he also wants to characterize how those processes are realized by neural circuits. And his research has been influential for many reasons, but I'm going to choose just one of those. And that is that his work is exceptional in addressing important questions in experimentally realistic ways. So in particular, John tests theories of linguistic knowledge and representation against data that are as natural as possible, such as having participants read or listen to a story, so that Ideally, as a discipline, what we're doing then for, from the kind of data that John is gathering for us, is we come closer to understanding language processing as it would occur outside the lab. But it's also a powerful approach because it brings a wider range of data to bear on testing theory. Okay, so John's research, it's supported by NSF. It appears in the top journals of the discipline. And he also has a new book that is scheduled, I think, to appear this summer. John, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I thought I saw that it's coming out in June. Okay. Um, with Oxford University Press titled Language in the Brain, A Slim Guide to Neurolinguistics. So I know that I am excited about what I'm going to learn from John in the last hour, next hour because I always learn a lot when I listen to him. And I invite you to join me in welcoming Professor John Brennan, who will be speaking today on lessons learned while searching for syntax in the brain. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, for that wonderful introduction. It's a real pleasure to have this chance to uh, share with you all some work we've been doing in the lab. It's, it's been wonderful to meet many of you, those of you who are visiting our department over the last few days. I've had wonderful conversations with some of you. I've not had the chance to meet all of you, but I hope, uh, well, this will be a very one-sided conversation at, at first, but perhaps they'll have other opportunities before the day is closed of, of having that, uh, those conversations. I know some of us are joining from different time zones. I'm gonna try to keep uh, the energy uh, up or <laughs> as much as I can while chat, while chatting. Uh, Pam, I do, I do have this book that just came out. Uh, you can pre-order it now, pre-order it now. That, okay, that's the only thing I'm gonna say about the book. Okay. Um, all right, I, I, I wanna start, um, I wanna start back in the year 2005, 2005. That is, happens to be the year that I began graduate school the year I would have been visiting graduate programs. And uh, I was, uh, and, and thinking perhaps about a career in neurolinguistics. And in 2005, I saw uh, this paper, this paper came out uh, in 2005 in a book, a book called 21st Century Psycholinguistics. And this book, uh, uh, and in particular this paper, the, the goal was to kind of assess and to set the stage for what the state of the art in neurolinguistic research was going to be. Uh, but the assessment uh, from this paper by uh, Dave Embick and David Popel was strikingly pessimistic. Pessimistic, right? So they were setting up, looking at a field whose ostensible goal was to take uh, properties of the brain, like neurons and axons and electrical activity, and properties of language, like, like uh, uh, phrase structure, dependencies, or uh, features. Uh, or phonological features, socio industrial characteristics, you know, across the different range of linguistic constructs we might be interested in. And to, the field is trying to map from one to the other. And the, the, the columns in the middle of the, of the, of the um, slide kind of try to show what these two sets of objects might look like. And, and, then, and then to map between them, the authors concluded that at the bottom, it's highlighted, to our knowledge, there's not a single case of a successful reduction or uh, in these terms that is mapping from one to the other in the domain of language, not a single case. So this is a somewhat bleak start to a career in neurolinguistics. Um, 10 years later, I'll add 10 years later, the same authors were reflecting again on, the, on the, this idea of neurolinguistics 
And if anything, they were, they were more pessimistic. Writing uh, in 2015, at present, there is no clear idea of how the brain represents and computes any of the computations that are part of language. So this is some strong rhetoric. Uh, it's, a call to, to, it's a call to action, a call for caution of what was being done and a call to think carefully about what ought to be done in the future. And this sort of strong record is important, it's helpful because it forces us to confront assumptions and limitations in, in the work that we're doing uh, to think about how we can how we can do that better. So, so 15 odd years ago, it's this it's in this environment that I started thinking about how to make progress on this apparently uphill struggle to link properties of language with properties of the brain. And um, I guess what I want to do uh, with the time we have is to talk about three lessons I've learned, or or maybe it's better to say lessons that I'm continuing to try to learn. Uh, with a special focus on the brain basis of, of syntax. Just happen, just that's gonna be the kind of a domain of focus of, of the attention today. So I, I've learned, for example, that the syntactic faculty in particular is not monolithic, but it is in the phrasing here contains multitudes in a way I want to elaborate on. Uh, I, I've tried to learn to embrace uh, a kind of reasoning that I call here this and that reasoning, or I should say this and that to get the emphasis uh, right. Uh, I'll try to say more about that in a moment. And uh, in these efforts, I've been reminded to be careful not to confuse causes with effects. Well, that seems uh, obvious enough, um, you might say. You might, you might be right. But I want to see if I can convince you that there is something interesting in the path that uh, the field has taken and, and our work has, has kind of taken in these uh, in this last decade or decade and a half um, to confront the challenges that I just kind of highlighted a moment ago. And I want to ask together maybe if it's reasonable to be maybe a, a bit more optimistic now in 2022 about the state of connecting language with brains. So that, that's what we'll, we'll see where we are with that uh, in a little bit. Okay, is this okay? Everyone on the chat, people on the chat, okay? You can kind of shout out if you're there and you wanna, you know, that's always fun. Rowan, Rowan had raised, did you want to say something, Rowan? You can probably manage that. I need to click something. There we go. No, you took your hand down. That might've been a mistake. Okay, we're all good. Uh, no, I don't have a screen. Okay, and I'm good. So, 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 so the, when, when this effort began, when my own effort efforts kind of began, uh, the main tool folks were using to study syntactic structure in particular in the brain, like phrase structure in the brain, was to uh, look at uh, stimuli, to confront the brain with stimuli that had uh, more or less syntactic structure in it. So that could be, for example, a sentence like is shown at the top of this table here, I believe that you should accept the proposal of your new associate. This is like a, 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 um, a a sentence with multiple kind of phrasal, phrasal components and compare that to stimuli with the same number of words, but that had less structure in some way. So for instance, that could include this list of words at the, in the middle of the table. That's just a list, a sequence of words that don't form phrases together. Or uh, that stimuli could kind of be more like what's in the middle of the table of, of kind of small phrases that are otherwise isolated from each other, like pairs of words or, or three word phrases or four word phrases. And, and some of this work uh, varied whether the stimuli, the words that were included in the, in the studies um, were real words or, or were made up pseudo words that lacked, um, lacked meaning, but otherwise fit sort of the, the phonological or perhaps orthographic properties, depending on how the study is being run of the language. And that's shown between the top and the bottom. But the point is that you're comparing stimuli with more structure to stimuli with less structure. And across a whole range of studies of efforts to do this, a broad uh, a set of brain regions were found to be involved in some way in processing sentence structure. And these regions are highlighted on the right-hand side of the slide. This includes the frontal lobe, uh, and this includes you know, areas across the what's the temporal lobe of the brain onto the parietal lobe a little bit. And um, so this is a, like a lot of neural tissue, a lot of neural tissue to associate with a particular uh, uh, linguistic function. And again, thinking about that mapping of linguistic features to neural features, this is not a clear mapping from one to the other. It's not the case that syntax 
is being associated with a particularly fine grained notion of, of some neural neural circuit. So it's, it's against work like this that, uh, that we uh, started pursuing a different idea, a different approach to how to think about syntax in the brain. And, and the idea was to think about the mapping from syntax linguistic construct to the brain in terms of dynamics, in terms of the process of building or discovering phrase structure as a sentence unfolds in time. Uh, so this is uh, incremental sentence processing. So this idea of incremental sentence processing, or I'm gonna use the term incremental parsing, uh, in fact has been studied extensively in psycholinguistics and in computational linguistics. Uh, and so our efforts were to take that existing body of work and ask whether that can give us some leverage as a new lens into the brain basis of, of syntax. So we take, for example, algorithms, uh, one is illustrated in the animated GIF here, that build a structure incrementally, and we can quantify the parsing state, like how much structure is it building word by word, uh, and ask whether brain activity might correlate with that incremental construction of sentence structure in one way or another. Okay. Um, so when we first did this, uh, it, we got this kind of exciting result, which is that, uh, and it was exciting in this way that I've tried to focus on here in its precision, in that the uh, brain activity that we saw to correlate with this syntactic building process was, was itself quite focal in, in this region, this is called the anterior temporal lobe, and there's no quizzes or tests at the end of this talk, so take these terminology, you know, do what you want with the terminology. So that was pretty, uh, pretty neat. Uh, but when we did it again, well, we got some good news and some bad news when we did it again. The good news is that this wasn't like a one-off hiccup. That is to say that if we look at the anterior temporal lobe and we do the same sort of research project, but with a new data sets and, and some revisions to our models, we again see activity in that same region of the brain that correlates with sentence structure. Uh, but that's not the only activity we find that correlates with sentence structure. And uh, so we see activity also, for instance, in the frontal lobe of the brain and also in other parts of the temporal lobe. Of the, we see a, large, a larger swath of brain activity that seems to um, correlate with this, what we thought of as a more precise account of the incremental construction of sentence structure, word by word. And, and we've, uh, we've done this sort of again uh, and again and again. <laughs> And in all these cases, we indeed see this um, more distributed, this larger picture seems to be borne out. Now it's a, it includes that original quite focal picture of uh, image, uh, but it goes beyond that. Uh, so what, what's been going on? What have we been up to uh, across these, uh, this is a decade plus of work uh, that is, um, has some consistency to it, but also is, is, is showing us some complexity and is not yet showing us that precision or granularity that we were seeking. What's been going on? So to think about this more precisely, I wanna dive into this most uh, recent, recent finding. Um, this, is, this is work that I've uh, really been grateful for uh, the wonderful collaborative team to pursue. And I wanna highlight in particular, uh, Milos Stanojevic, who's currently at Google's DeepMind in London. The, the, mod the models that we're using are de were developed originally by Milos. And the data we're drawing on were collected and, and have been uh, analyzed by Shohini Bhattasali at the University of Maryland. This is a very much a team effort that I'm just kind of advertising here. Um, so one dimension that has been uh, taken a lot of our attention as we've developed the models and the data that we're using to pair these dynamic idea of syntax with brain activity. One dimension has been, well, what kind of dynamics do we really mean? And, and, and one uh, aspect of that has to do with how uh, eager or conservative the um, algorithm that builds sentence structure is. So does it build sentence, does it kind of get ahead of itself to build sentence structure that it, it thinks might be coming, but it doesn't have all the evidence for yet? That would be more equivalent to what's happening on the left-hand side of this figure. Or does it hold back a little bit and kind of accumulate as much evidence as possible before postulating syntactic structure. And that's more associated with the algorithm that's schematized on the right-hand side. And then there's variants of this, for instance, shown in the middle. So, so we've kind of played with this dimension uh, quite a bit. And I think us and other groups have found, uh, I think some evidence 
that uh, something that is happening at least the, of what class of these sorts of, of algorithms might be the best way to think about the dynamics of sentence processing. Something towards the left-hand side of this figure seems more accurate. Uh, so, so, so that's kind of what we've done. And that's one of the dimensions that has evolved in that, that graph or that, those sets of pictures I showed you a moment ago. So I actually wanna turn our attention somewhere else in this most recent project. This, our, the, the place I wanna turn our attention uh, in this most recent work is about what we're building when we parse sentence structure. Because as I think we all know here, you need more than just constituents to capture the patterns and systematic rules of the world's languages. That is, you need to also capture long distance dependencies. And the sorts of structures that uh, we've been using in our modeling work and that has been used elsewhere in the field to think about syntactic structure as a dynamic process, those models don't on the main capture the kinds of syntactic dependencies that we see in the world. So these are the dependencies like we see in Dutch, that uh, these are Dutch relative clauses that involve uh, crossed dependencies between subject and verb. There are uh, dependency in uh, Walbury is shown at the bottom that also involves crossing between uh, ele various elements of the sentence that stand in um, uh, syntactic relationship with each other. And so we know from computational work, from mathematical linguistics work, what kinds of grammars are necessary to characterize exactly these dependencies that are found in the world's languages. And they're not the grammars that we've been using in our models before. So that's the, what I want to, uh, so, so it's this take on, on this challenge that I want to um, highlight in terms of some of our most recent work in building these better, more dynamic models of, of syntax in the brain. Um, so, so the uh, class of grammars that I'm going to focus on is called a combinatorial categorical grammar, or CCG, CCG, okay? Uh, and an illustration of a, a syntactic derivation with such a grammar is shown on the left-hand side of this slide. So let me just give you what matters here. So what matters here is understanding that this is a kind of grammar, a well-studied uh, syntactic uh, uh, tool that can characterize both constituency and the kinds of long distance dependencies that are seen in many across many of the world's languages. So here we have a relative clause uh, on the on the top, uh, sorry, on the right hand side is a kind of, of, of coordination that gets kind of challenging when you have to link a subject with multiple coordinated verb phrases. And so it's a grammar, it's a it's a it's a grammar that can it has been engineered to, to capture these sorts of of relationships, so that's great. But but this particular grammar has also been paired with um, with a parser, yeah, with an algorithm that can work incrementally from left to right to identify the best structure for a given sequence of words. And the table on the right hand side shows the internal state of such a parser. Uh, as it navigates, well, this particular uh, sentence up here, Mary might find happiness and forget me. I, uh, yeah, that, that just happens to be the example sentence from the uh, uh, paper that I, I took this, this figure from. But the point is that we can uh, quantify exactly how the parser is behaving as it moves uh, from word to word incrementally, kind of left to right in this case. And we can, for instance, count how many derivational steps it takes in order to identify the appropriate structure for this sentence. We can count the number of steps. And it's this counting of steps that we are then gonna use as a, a predictor or estimator of brain activity. So, so the way we, we link this modeling work with the brain is, is in the following way. So the, um, the, the parser uh, confronts a uh, set of text taken from an audiobook story. In this case, it's the story of The Little Prince. If y'all know The Little Prince, it's a good story. If you haven't read it, uh, you should do so. Very, uh, very enjoyed. Uh, and uh, so the parser uh, parses this text and it builds these sorts of structures. And, and we can count how much work it does word by word to build those sorts of structures. And, and what's great here is the structures are have, have this kind of grammatical richness to them that was lacking in some of the earlier modeling work. And then uh, we have humans, people, also listen to the same story and we collect their brain data. We use fMRI in this case to do that. And I'm not gonna go into the details of the, the data 
kind of data set details, but I'm just going to get that out there. And, and then we can ask about the statistical relationship or fit between uh, the steps the parser takes word by word and the data we record from people word by word and ask, is the brain data doing something? Is it going up when the parser is doing more work? Is it going down when the parser is doing less work? That's exactly what we ask. Okay. So this kind of comparison of statistical fit is the basis for this, uh, what we see here, this map, this map of a range of brain regions that seem to be involved in building syntactic structure in a way that accords with this grammatical formalism that seems appropriate for human language. And, uh, and, and also with the dynamics, the dynamic sort of uh, predictiveness or eagerness that also seems appropriate for how humans process, uh, process language. So this is pretty exciting. This is the first time um, that I've certainly seen a, uh, a model that really does have the syntactic richness like I've been wanting to do this since my dissertation. So this has been very exciting to get this kind of, uh, uh, get, get, this in, um, get this work done. Uh, just to unpack this graph here, red regions indicate a positive statistical relationship such that more parser actions are leading to a, an increase in the fMRI signal and blue indicates a negative relationship. So more parser actions, but there's less brain activity in that particular region. So what should we take from this graph? Well, one thing we can take away is, uh, is that there's a lot going on. There's just a lot going on. We can look over here on the top left and see, yeah, there's a red. These are statistically reliable effects over here all across this region of the brain, temporal lobe, and all into the parietal lobe, and across the inferior and middle uh, frontal gyruses. And it's not just over here in the left hemisphere, but oh, it's over here in the right hemisphere. So there's uh, still a lot going on. So our models have become more precise and more, I think, adequate for capturing human language. But our neural results are not yet, don't yet gain in, in precision, in that kind of narrow mapping of, of constructs from the one domain to constructs from the other. So, so before I really kind of get into that uh, anymore, I want, to, um, I want to kind of show a comparison. I want to show a comparison. Uh, so, so the comparison is going to have this idea. So we have to consider what else is going on when we process sentences. Like there, we aren't just building a tree or a, a, a dependency graph or, or a CCG derivation. We aren't just building a, that sort of thing when we process sentences. What else is going on? Well, one other thing that people have been thinking carefully about for a long time is that brain activity increases when things are unexpected. In fact, there are, are kind of theories of a brain of neural processing more generally, sort of far outside of linguistics, that really highlight the idea that the brain predicts things. That's kind of what one of its main jobs. So we want to think about, well, what we want to think about that factor as we analyze these data and try to isolate syntactic processing. To do that, now state-of-the-art artificial intelligence, like AI systems, uh, they are really, really, really good at um, identifying, at crunching through enormous amounts of data to identify statistical patterns and to estimate really well what sorts of things might come next to make predictions. This is what, uh, this is what you know, your autocomplete is doing, and this is what your search is doing, and this is what, so the idea of building a statistical model that basically has experienced lots of language and uses that information to make a reasonable guess of what might come next is a very powerful engineering tool that has really kind of taken over a lot of engineering and language tools, uh, certainly over the last 10 years. And so I'm, I've, I've been saying this while you've been looking at this article. This is an article that was quote unquote written by such an AI system, the state-of-the-art AI system as of about well, this article is from 2020. It remained state of the art until about the middle of last year. It was superseded, I think, in November at least. Um, but still, a very, very, I mean, this is one of the, the most highest achieving kind of artificial models for language. And really, what it works is by estimating what is coming up next. It's what's called a language model. And so, humans are sensitive to those statistical patterns, the patterns that such a model is very good at recovering. And so what we're gonna do next is use exactly this uh, uh, computational model called GPT-3 
uh, to kind of see if we can parcelate out the, the sensitivity the brain shows to prediction and ask if there's any remainder for structure building. Okay, that's what we're doing next. So on the left-hand side of this particular slide, we have the, a graph I showed you earlier. That graph comes from our, our syntactic parser, CCG. We see the maps of the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe there. And in the middle, we now see the, newest, the newer uh, factor or feature, which is an estimate of predictability. So a word-by-word -word estimate of predictability that comes from this state-of-the-art uh, language model, GPT-3. And we can see we shouldn't be surprised to see at all that this GPT-3 model correlates very highly with a broad range of brain activity. This has been shown by several groups now. Uh, and, the, and, and, and much of that brain activity overlaps, in fact, with what we see in our syntactic parser, including the frontal lobe and including the temporal lobe in both hemispheres. But what I wanna highlight is, is what's going on on the right-hand side. On the right-hand side, we see a, a, a one particular way of computing the residual of what's left over to be captured by our syntax model after we've sort of parsed it out um, this, this, the fact that certain words are more predictable than others, which is captured by our state-of-the-art AI. And we can see this when we do look at this sort of residual activity that there's work that is still being done by our syntactic structure model. That work, we see that in this frontal region, we see that also in this posterior kind of temporal parietal region right here. There's a residual going in the other direction along the temporal lobe. There is work that is remaining that we capture with our computational model of syntax that is not captured by prediction alone. There are details, lots of details on what's going on, especially on the right-hand side and how we compute that. Those details I'm setting aside here. But the main takeaway actually at this point is that this, even this map here, where we've controlled for a very important underlying uh, feature in terms of predictability, it's still, well, it's still fairly coarse grained. This is an important point. It's still very coarse grained in terms of the range of areas that seem to be associated with structure. Despite that coarse grain is present, despite the increased computational sophistication of the model. It's a, it's a good model. Like I'm very happy with this model. Uh, and, and we have a, 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 that good syntactic model is paired with, I think, the best possible control analysis that um, us or anyone has been able to do at this point by, by taking advantage of this uh, state-of-the-art AI. But despite, I think, the increased model sophistication, increased uh, care in our control analyses, we are not yet isolating specific subroutines of syntax that map in a uh, interpretable way to subparts uh, of, of, of neural circuits or, or maybe just map to neural circuits straightforwardly. So that straightforward mapping from one column to the other that we began today with, we still don't see. We don't see despite I think really positive advances in the modeling effort that we're bringing to bear against the data. So, so there's a lot to do with this picture in front of us right now. And this picture is I, for me on a very state of the art sense of like where we're at and what we have yet to do. So, so one thing to do is to recognize, and I've, I'm re reprinting this uh, table from earlier, that, that this idea of incremental structure building, there's actually a lot of sub parts of that. There's a lot going on under the hood. And we haven't yet uh, teased apart those sub parts. We're treating that process as monolithic. And that as an abstraction uh, makes a lot of sense, but it's not actually like, intellectually, but it's not actually working in terms of grabbing onto the brain at the right level. So, so we need to do some work separating out the pieces of the model. And that's actually what I wanna focus the rest of my talk today on. But I want to mention before going on to do that, there are other paths in front of us as well. So these paths include thinking carefully about what kind of brain data we ought to be analyzing like that. Uh, the maps I've been showing you reflect one particular way of measuring what the brain is doing, uh, but it's far, it's far, far, far from the only way we could measure. So there are us and, and others um, have been thinking about ways, what kinds of signals from the brain we ought to measure in order to better align with kind of how the brain might be processing syntax. That's shown uh, in the middle 
and, and, and in another way is shown on the right-hand side, the kind of data we might wanna use. So those are paths that we're very keen to explore, but I'm not gonna talk further about those paths, those paths today. So lesson one, well, you'll see it's, it's a lesson that is incomplete. That's a lesson that I'm still learning, but, but the, the core of it is that syntax is not a single thing. There's not a straightforward mapping from syntactic constructs to neural signals and neural circuits. Now, one step we've made in unpacking this complex is to think of syntax dynamically as a parsing process. And I, I'm, uh, I, I think that is a necessary step in, um, in, better to, in understanding the brain basis of, of, of syntax. But what we've seen, and I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced of at this point, is that it's, it's not sufficient. It's not going to be sufficient to meet that challenge. As our models have increased in, in sophistication, and I think in linguistic accuracy, we have not yet narrowed down on kind of specific sub-circuits of brain activity. So we need to do something else. We need to do something else. And there are multiple paths ahead for how we might do that. And I'm going to point to some of the first steps we've taken on, on one, of those, one of those paths. OK, how are we doing? Folks still here? Folks still with me? Folks logged into the meeting. I'm gonna take a sip of coffee. Okay, some folks are here, good. Okay, second lesson, second lesson. So the second lesson I called this and that. Uh, and this comes from thinking about what is the proper way to reason about the subroutines in parsing. This is the direction I kind of want to focus. And, and we're gonna um, specifically attend to the role of memory in these, in these subroutines. Now, for me, this lesson has been associated with, I've been learning a lot from it, working with uh, Tsu Yin Tung, one of our uh, graduate students. And I'll be talking a little bit about some work that has emerged in Tsu Yin's uh, dissertation project. Um, I, I, Tsu Yin presented this a little uh, uh, yesterday. So some of us got a preview of it in the psycholinguistics lab meeting. Um, and I'm not going to do it justice, I'm afraid. I, I, there, were, there are details and nuances that I'm afraid I'm not going to quite capture. But I hope to give you, uh, uh, to take away some kind of key insights that I, I think Tsu Yun is leading us towards. Um, to understand this direction, I actually want to want to be a little bit historical. And I want to think about the history of what makes Sentences hard to process. This is kind of one of these guiding psycholinguistic questions that's been going on for quite some time. So, so at the outset, <laughs> I, I said we'd go back to the beginning. At the outset of, of, of generative grammar and of really of psycholinguistics in the 60s, the idea was, well, what makes sentence processing hard is structure. The more structure you have, and structure was uh, characterized in terms of phrase structure rules, but also especially in terms of transformations at the time, the more structure you have, the harder it's going to be to process. And, and that idea um, starting uh, in the mid, uh, early to mid 70s was, was found to be not, um, not quite adequate to capture the range of data that were being collected. St just focusing on structure alone was um, inadequate to capture a range of data. And attention turned starting in the 80s to, uh, to isolating sentences that are hard, have more ambiguity and it's resolving syntactic ambiguity that makes sentence processing hard. So this was sort of a shift in thought led in particular by uh, Janet Fodor and Lynn Frazier. Um, an alternative perspective was developed beginning in, uh, I think in the 90s, I think of Rick Lewis's um, 1993 dissertation, very influential here, in uh, drawing our attention in sentence processing to the role of memory and thinking that what might make sentence processing hard was not so much ambiguity, but rather cases where there was a burden in memory and, and how to characterize that burden then became a, a object of, of debate. And that, um, and I, I'm gonna kind of say a little bit more about where that debate has led us now uh, in, in a moment. But right around the time that memory was, uh, was sort of like taking off as, a, as capturing a, 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 in terms of its computational sophistication and in terms of the range of data, it's, was capturing another trend came online, the trend of thinking about prediction. So maybe, maybe, and I actually already previewed this a moment ago, maybe what makes sentence processing hard is, is when we have trouble predicting things. Now we can't predict what's coming next and that could be it. And that was sort of introduced as an alternative to, to the idea that, that of memory load, prediction or memory, prediction or memory. 
very rapidly, um, it was recognized that this idea of, of what that census processing hard when it's hard to predict things was recognized as a variant or a, a reformulation of the idea of syntactic ambiguity. Because when things are ambiguous, it's harder to predict what's coming next. And when things are unambiguous, it's easier to predict what's coming next. So these two perspectives are related to each other. And capturing that relationship mathematically was really, in, uh, was, uh, I think, a really success, a big success story from work from, from people like John Hale and Roger Levy. So where this takes us now or, or in the last couple of years is a world in which there are kind of two leading perspectives of what makes sentence processing hard, of memory load, and, and prediction and ambiguity. Um, and attention now with the clarity and clarifying nature of these two threads of thought, attention now is turned to what is the relationship between these different perspectives. And there was a time where the relationship was this or that. Is it, is, for, you know, is, is memory load the right way to think about what makes sense of processing art or is prediction this or that? And, and, and okay, I've already previewed what I'm gonna say. I, we're gonna say this and that. There's gonna be a relationship between these that we can understand and characterize. We can measure it and we can, and we can model it. And that's what I wanna talk about next. So the, um, the evidence, so I wanna do two things when I talk about this and that. I wanna talk about the relationship between memory load and, and prediction as, as ways of thinking about what makes sense of processing hard and ways of thinking about what we wanna make our parse, how we wanna characterize the parsers that we're using to, for instance, measure brain activity. So I wanna talk about evidence for the interaction between these different kind of frameworks. And I wanna talk about some, some modeling work for characterizing that interaction. Uh, to do that, we need to take a closer look at what these memory load theories in particular, what they've kind of converged on in the last, let's say 10 years. Uh, this uh, work, the field has converged, I think, um, for example, based on, on work from our colleague Rick Lewis um, and others on a theory of memory load called Q-based retrieval, Q-based retrieval. And here's what I want you to know about Q-based retrieval. The idea there, amongst other things, is that sentence processing becomes difficult when items in memory interact and interfere. So you're trying to retrieve something from memory. And if there's, it's getting confused of which of many items to retrieve, that is gonna be what makes sentence processing difficult uh, from this particular perspective of memory load. Uh, so we see such an example on the slide here where we have a uh, sentence, I wanted to see if he really understood anything. Um, there's the noun, uh, the pronoun he and the pronoun I, both of which could be subjects of the verb understand in terms of, they both are in isolation could be a subject. In fact, both are subjects in terms of this broader sentence, uh, but, but, the, um, but only he is the subject of, of this particular verb understood. But the idea of Q-based retrieval is that the, the memory operation that connects this pronoun with this verb is subject to interference from this other pronoun, which also has kind of a subjecthood associated with it. So that's the intuition behind um, interference and in this particular perspective of memory load. So what Siyun has been developing in her experiments and her theoretical work is thinking about how this interference could interact with, could be modulated by a predictability, how the, we, these two frameworks ought to be considered together. And so I'm gonna talk about one of her experiments that tries to measure this sort of interaction. Um, this particular experiment that I'm about to talk about focuses on sentences that are ungrammatical, ungrammatical. So probing for interference effects in ungrammatical sentences. Now, why it's important to use ungrammatical sentences here is really theoretically quite interesting, but I'm not going to answer it right now because I don't think I have time. I really know I don't have time. So I will try to uh, get through this. So I'll just, we just have to accept, accept, accept that the sentences are ungrammatical, but ungrammatical in an interesting way. So Tsuyun is testing for interaction between memory interference and predictability. And she's doing so by manipulating properties of sentences in Mandarin Chinese that involve missing noun phrases. So these are cases of NP ellipsis. So here's an example. The mother brought the shirt next to the luggage and the daughter brought another to go on the trip. 
So in this sentence, there's a dependency between the anaphoric word another and the noun shirt, okay? And so we can think about that in terms of retrieval. Another what? Another shirt in principle. Now there's another noun that could in, be um, uh, interfere with the memory retrieval of another. That is the word luggage in this sentence. So as you're processing another, you are retrieving in memory what word, another what? And both shirt and luggage are, are possible uh, uh, targets of that, in that they share some relevant features. Uh, shirt shares more features um, because it is, it is in the right structural position. And luggage shares fewer features because it's in the wrong structural position. And there's a typo here, that should be a minus right there. That should be, a, so just think about plus minus and minus minus. So the retrieval is like easier to get to shirt, okay? But just because it's easier doesn't mean it's correct. I said a moment ago that these sentences are ungrammatical. And they're ungrammatical because uh, this is Mandarin, not English. And so it's not the word another here. It's the Mandarin word yi ben. And this is a classifier, a noun classifier, which uh, semantically selects for certain nouns. And neither shirt nor luggage are the right kind of noun. That's why that should be a minus. That should be a minus right there. Because neither short nor luggage are the right kind of noun to combine with this classifier. And that's why this memory retrieval uh, does not succeed in yielding a grammatical sentence. Why do we have this feature? Because we can, Zhu Yun can manipulate this stimuli in order to present another word in this intermediate interfering position. For instance, the word book. Now the word book, this is a typo, sorry for this. That should be a plus because the word book is an appropriate, semantically appropriate word to combine with the classifier yi ben. And so this introduces interference. When book is present here, there are two nouns that have structurally, that have kind of partial overlap with the features that this anaphoric word is looking for. And so that increase in possibility is exactly what interference is all about. So we can compare book to sentences with book to sentences with luggage to, to, to modulate interference in this sort of sentence. But of course, Tsuyun is, and that's been done by, by, by groups. Okay, so this, is, this has all been done. Now what Tsuyun is doing is using this uh, interference protocol and then adding a new component, which is about prediction. So this word here, this verb here brought, well, it doesn't carry very strong predictions with it because of course you can bring many, many, many things with you. There are many possible objects that uh, can be brought, including shirts and books and bags and luggage and, and any old thing. Um, but this verb can be changed. For instance, if you uh, change out the sentence, so instead of the word brought, you include the, wor the word where or war in the past tense, then that increases the predictability of certain word, the things that you can wear. You're not gonna wear luggage or books, but you might wear shirts. And so this sort of construction allows Tsuyun to compare how retrieval interference might uh, operate and, and uh, we can measure the effect of retrieval interference and then ask whether that effect of retrieval interference comparing luggage to book is mo itself modulated by whether a word is a more or less predictable to ask how these two different frameworks connect to each other. So that is what this design allows Tsuyun to do. So in the interest of time, so here are the stimuli and, and, and with the Mandarin details, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on these stimuli. I'm hoping that our understanding we have uh, from my sort of what I've given so far is going to be adequate. Uh, Tsuyun tests for effects of retrieval interference so that memory load cost using uh, EEG. Uh, so spe specifically, she's focusing on a particular brain signal called the P600. And we see an example of a P600 brain signal here. And this signal is uh, valuable because it's been strongly associated with uh, uh, difficulty resolving syntactic dependencies, exactly the sorts of syntactic dependencies that become more difficult or maybe that can become more easier when there is or is not retrieval interference. Uh, so exactly this sort of effect has been observed previously for retrieval interference. And now we see so you can test 
whether it's also a, whether that effect is affected, <laughs> that effect is affected, that's clear. That effect is modulated by uh, the predictability of a particular word. So here's what Suyin finds. On the left-hand side, we're just tuning our, our intuitions first. On the left-hand side, we have a, a comparison of brain response from her participants when they uh, uh, read sentences that are grammatical in blue compared to ungrammatical in red. And what we see here is these differences are what is a classic P600. That's what a P600 looks like. And, and this sort of effect, this is a P600 for retrieval. Uh, sorry, this is just a P600, P, a classic P600 uh, that has been observed uh, uh, previously for syntactic effects and for retrieval interference. So it's just, we're just establishing the presence of this P600, it looks like that. So the key question is what happens to this P600 when you increase or decrease retrieval interference or increase and decrease predictability. And this is shown here on the right. So let me see if I can tune in, orient you to these, these graphs. What we're seeing here, it, each line represents the difference in brain activity at a particular area of the head. Uh, when there's low interference compared to when there's high interference. Okay, and in this particular way of looking at things, uh, that should lead to, there should be a bigger P600 uh, a bigger P600 is shown when the line is, uh, when kind of the line goes positive. Okay, so when, when the trace goes above zero, that means that there's more of a P600 effect in that particular comparison for low interference compared to high interference. Okay. So it's like the difference between these two lines becomes cashed out as a single line that goes above zero. That's what's happening. That's the first thing I want you to know here. The second thing is that this particular perspective allows you to compare what happens to that P600 for interference when you make in low versus high expectation, when you vary whether something is predictable or not. And as I think you can see, uh, predictability matters. So the effect of interference is present, that is the line is sort of above zero, we see it here, we see it here, when uh, there is a strong prediction for the next word, but that interference effect goes away when there is less of a prediction. So the takeaway here, this is a complicated result and I'm not doing it justice, okay, I get that. But the takeaway is that the effect of predictability of the structure of the sentence and the effect of memory and its interference, they're interacting. Both factors are modulating how the parser is resolving the structures of this particular sentence. So we can measure the way in which these two different ways of thinking about sentence processing, we can measure how they interact. That is, uh, that is the takeaway. Um, I, I wanna really, really briefly illustrate uh, this. Now, we, we just seen some data relating to it and I wanna illustrate this from a theory perspective as well. So the, this is theory that's coming from uh, Su Hyun Ryu. Uh, and Rick Lewis in the psychology program here. And what there are, uh, what Su Hyun has, has shown is that, uh, is, is how this interaction kind of manifests as a function of what the state of the memory system is. So, so let me try to unpack that. Okay, so what are we looking at? We're looking here at a, a, a representation of a kind of computational model of language processing that we actually already saw a glimpse of. Remember I showed you something called GPT-3 earlier and it wrote an article in the Guardian newspaper to convince you that it's you know, a, a harmless robot. Okay, so this model that they're using here that this picture comes from is the kind of earlier cousin of GPT-3 called um, GPT-2. Yeah, so, so G okay, you get it. And, um, and that, as I said before, these models are very good at predicting what word is coming next. And that's what we're looking, the gray box here always introduced, indicates the word whose prediction is currently being evaluated. And the red lines indicate what parts of the model's memory are being used to make that prediction. Let me say that again. The, gra the chart is indicating what parts of the model's memory are being used to guide its next prediction. And what we see, what Suhyun uh, has, uh, uh, Ryu has shown us is that this sort of model 
the, the role of interference is in changing the kind of information that the model makes for its next prediction. So it's, it's, it's capturing exactly how the memory system and this prediction-based framework, exactly how they trade off against each other. They work together. And so we can see that visually, if we look here, this is ungrammatical sentences. Remember I said ungrammatical is gonna matter and I didn't say why, I'm still not saying why, but we're looking at ungrammatical sentences. And when there is an interfering noun in memory, then the prediction of the current word is being influenced by the, the proper, in this case, the proper subject of that noun, of that verb, excuse me, but it's also being influenced by the interfering noun. So the interfering noun in memory is, is, uh, is having a bearing on what the predictions are for the next word. And that prediction is not happening when there's not, a, in the, when there's not an interfering noun. So this is a super fast glimpse about how the modeling work is coming together to, to capture the relationship between these two different frameworks of prediction and interference. Oh, I am short on time. Let's see what I can do in these last couple of minutes. So lesson two, this and that. Memory-based and prediction-based accounts of sentence processing are not in competition. They are not in competition. But, but we have to say more than that. And I think we're starting to see that path forward. So, so Tsuyun is showing us a way we can quantify the nature of the way they interact with each other. We see that with Mandarin noun phrase ellipsis as one tool to quantify that relationship. And uh, we're now also seeing models emerging that help to capture what that relationship ought to look like from a theoretical perspective. And so the measurements now set the stage for us to test, put those models to the test. So I think that's kind of an exciting development uh, in, in, in terms of what these parsers, what are the subroutines in these parsers that we need to use to understand brain activity? Okay, I want to see if I can do this last bit in five minutes. That's my goal. That's my goal. Uh, this last lesson concerns the kind of information, the kind of representations in memory that serve to guide these parsing processes. And I wanna draw in this last bit on some very interesting insights and data collected by uh, Rachel Weisler in her dissertation that she completed uh, uh, last summer. Um, the, this last lesson begins with a puzzle, a puzzle that has to do with that thing, the P600, which I already told you about a little bit ago. And this was that same picture I showed you before, the P600 here. That P600 that seems to be a brain response that is sensitive to the difficulty of resolving a syntactic dependency. Okay, that's the P600. But back in 2005, there's that year again. Back in 2005, um, researchers, in, in this case, a study by Al Kim, uh, recognized that the P600 seems to be sensitive to things that go beyond syntax. And this was a puzzle. So over here on the right hand side, we have a what looks like that same brain response, that same P600 brain response for a comparison of sentences that uh, seem to be more semantic. In this case, it's uh, the phrase, the, the meal was devoured, which seems sensible enough, versus the meal was devouring. And, and their intuition when they conducted the study was that the, what's, what, what's going on in, this, in the dotted line in the second sentence is something, there's a mismatch of the semantic arguments. So meals don't devour things. They get devoured, but they don't do the devouring. That's, a semant that's not what they do. That's semantically wrong. And so they and others were looking at data uh, of this sort and um, considered what this might mean for the kinds of representations, of syntactic representations that are being constructed um, and, are, and are come to be in conflict in sentences like these. So I'm, I'm thinking in particular of an interesting quote from a review paper by Gina Cooperberg, in which she reasoned from data like this and others that sentence structure might be built up on the basis of primitive semantic features. So, so that sort of claim is a claim about representations. It's a claim that well, maybe what's going on here is um, a P600 happens when certain kinds of representations have come into conflict, and maybe those are semantic representations. Um, but I want to, so, so I want to question that, and I want to question it from the perspective of causes and effects. So to what extent do we want to think about the data, like the data I've showed you from the P600, as 
uh, a, 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 a semantic manipulation. So, so, it's a, so that this must be a semantic effect versus to, do we might want to disentangle uh, the cause of a particular brain response from the effect that that brain response tells us about. So let me see if I can make that a little more clear by focusing on some data that doesn't quite fit in with the picture we're seeing here. So the picture we're seeing here is that, well, when we manipulate syntax, we see a P600. When we manipulate semantics, we see P600. So maybe we need to have semantic features involved in syntactic construction. But the data I'm gonna show you from Rachel show that not only when we manipulate syntax or semantics, but also when we manipulate aspects of who is speaking to us or who we think is speaking to us, that also modulates this P600, this what I began with today as a syntax component. Who is speaking manipulate modulates this component? Let me let me illustrate that real quick. So in this experiment, this is Rachel's uh, one of Rachel's uh, uh, dissertation experiments. She manipulates uh, syntax in the following way using auxiliary deletion, which varies uh, in it, the rules governing it across American Englishes. And so, for example, a phrase uh, one sentence might be "She got sick, so she's coughing a lot." Uh, and and that, so that, that's sort of a control sentence there, uh, grammatical across a range of American Englishes. And it's compared to a, a variant that is ungrammatical across, um, across American Englishes. She got sick, so she'll coughing a lot, where that ill, that will morpheme is not compatible with the, this form of, of the verb. She got sick, so she'll coughing a lot, that's ungrammatical. Now, Rachel also included a very interesting condition where she varies the absence, she, uh, the, the presence or absence of the auxiliary is, um, which is um, found in certain varieties of American English, but not in others. And this is a really uh, fascinating manipulation, but it's not actually the point that I want to focus on today. And I'm mindful of the time, so I, I need to kind of move forward. So there's a, a wonderful nuance, and the main focus of this work is on this particular condition here, but that's not the focus I'm going to take. So the focus I'm going to take is on the comparison between present and ungrammatical. And it's going to vary as a function of who is speaking. And so in Rachel's experiment, the speaker was a single bi-dialectal male uh, uh, um, uh, user of American English who uh, recorded stimuli using either a standardized American English variant or an African American English variant, both of which they were native in. And so we have a presence, we have a manipulation of what is being said in terms of the grammaticality and a variation of who uh, of the, of the uh, English variant, the English dialect is being used that the participants are listening to as they, um, as they experience these, these sentences. And we're again gonna focus on that EEG and the, the P600 component. And what we see is a, 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 the, a, a, the presence of exactly such a P600 for ungrammatical sentences compared to uh, grammatical sentences. So that's the purple line compared to the green line here. So P600, P600. And if you wanna see, this is like another view of the same thing, but this P600, okay, great. But notice that this, this apparent P600 is present when the speaker was using a um, uh, standardized American English, but the participants did not show that P600 when that same individual changed their dialects use features of their dialect of African American English. The P600 goes away. So this brain response that was originally seen as sensitive to syntax, and then I mentioned some data showing people wondering maybe it's actually sensitive to semantics and represents semantic features. Well, now we're showing it's sensitive to who uh, you think you're listening to. So something about the social features that are being uh, uh, processed during language comprehension. So how do we put these things together? How do we think about the kinds of representations in memory that are guiding syntactic processing? And so this is, this is I'm, I'm trying to wrap up here as I try to pull these pieces together. So what we just saw is, um, is, is there's many parts about it that I'm not gonna be able to go into. These, uh, this sort of effect offers a window into studying how stereotypes affect language processing. But, but I'm not, and I'm not gonna get into that, but I'm gonna get, I'm kind of bothered by, I'm gonna get into why this particular brain response for syntax is being pushed around by so many different variables, like the meaning, and now like, like social variables. And I wanna bring these, uh, some of the lessons I've been kind of uh, drawing out, I wanna bring them together to, to think about why. 
So let's look at sentence processing from an incremental perspective. Okay, so we have uh, a, a sentence. We don't know where it's going to go, but the first word you hear is my. And uh, that word uh, is activating, uh, the, you know, we're starting to make guesses of what word might be coming next. Okay, so we can start listing those, those words that might be coming next. And as we list words might be coming next, we saw this in the parsing models that we did at the beginning of the talk, we start building out the structure, the phrase structure and dependencies that are going to incorporate that those words are going to be a part of. Okay. And the words and that structure is going to give us a representation of meaning, which I thoughtfully just put in the cloud here. So very detailed theory of semantics here. Uh, in my talk. Okay. But the, of course, this is not the only thing because we also as we are processing uh, language, we think about not what we're, people are saying only, but also who we are talking to. So you might reason about characteristics of who you're speaking to or communicating with, as well as these other characteristics. So the idea is that we can take this word and start activating representations at all of these levels. Okay. And then when a new word comes to us, we might well, we, we have to, we, we continue this process. These activations are available to influence what happens next, guiding predictions about upcoming words, upcoming structures, upcoming meanings, and refining our predictions and our, our representations of all at all of these levels. And this process unfolds in time. It unfolds in time dynamically at these distinct levels. So where this is going is to, is to recognize that when we violate an expectation, if we get a sentence like, Ma, she's so sick, she, she'll coughing a lot, or my sister, she'll uh, driving to work, or, or uh, the hearty meal devoured. When we, get a or when we get a sentence like that, that doesn't match our expectations, those expectations have been conditioned by all of these features because these representations have been activated in time as the sentence unfolds. And all of these features are available to condition what kind of what might be coming next, what might be the sentence structure that this person is going that this person is going to say next, or what might be the sentence structure most compatible with the meaning or the particular words that have activated so far. So it's that that move in from looking at the sentence processing dynamically that allows us to think carefully about how the effects of a mismatch might reflect not different representations. Oh, that must be a syntax uh, effect or a syntax or a semantics effect or social effect, but might tell us something about the causes, the causes that activated memory representations earlier in the sentence that were being used to guide our processing now later. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna say I have one final slide actually, and I realize I'm I'm, I'm grateful for your uh, patience as I've gone a little bit over time. Um, and this final slide, I hope to say this is my my attempt to convince myself, and and maybe if you're still with me, uh, to ask you to ask why should we be optimistic about the efforts to understand syntax in the brain. Because we began with a quote like this, no clear idea of how the brain represents and computes any of the computations that are part of language. It applies to syntax as much as to any other of the computations. Why optimistic? So let me, let me say what I've learned from these lessons that, that at least guide me in this particular perspective. So first off is the idea that we have constructed and we can continue to probe dynamic parsing models from computational psycholinguistics that capture cross-linguistic complexity. And these models provide a reasonable match to neural data. So I think this idea of moving to think about syntax dynamically is working for us. And we're getting closer to models that are appropriate for human language. And as we develop those models, um, we can are beginning to think more carefully and draw insights from research in memory, especially research on cue-based retrieval and theories that involve prediction to think about what the model is doing internally as it navigates from one word to the next to build up these structures. So we are, uh, we are, those perspectives are sharpening and I think they're gonna sharpen our understanding of brain activity. And finally, this last point that I made too abbreviated is that we are developing a refined and a better understanding about how different levels of representation in linguistics from, from structure to meaning 
to social characteristics, how those levels interact. We can quantify how they interact, and those, and we, and that, with that quantification, that stands ready to be incorporated into the next generation of models. We haven't done it yet, but I think we're standing kind of ready to do so. And this is why I feel optimistic. And so I thank, I thank you for your uh, extra patience this afternoon, and and I'm done. Okay, I'm good. Thank you, John, very much. <clears throat> this is wonderful. So much to take in. And I'm sitting here listening to it thinking like how, how this parallels so much of what I've been, you know, what we're doing in speech perception and how all of these things interact in, in ways that, you know, determine online processing of auditory information that's coming in. So fantastic. Lots for us to talk about, um, but not now. And um, no time now to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now I'll turn it over to all the other people who, who have uh, questions for you. So um, we're turning over now to our, our question and answer session. And um, please um, raise your hand if you have a question, if you're willing to do it that way. If not, um, you can populate a question into the chat. <clears throat> I did see as folks are thinking, I did see a, a note in the chat to post slide. I'm happy to post slides. Okay. Um, I didn't know if you'd seen that. Okay. Feel free to send an email. I'll, I'll see if I get it up on our website too. Thanks, John. Terrific. Yeah. Pam, do you want me to t field these or how does it work? Um, I mean, um, it might be hard for you to watch the, the, uh, the hand raising, um, or but you can field them anyway, ho however you want to do it. If, if, if you miss it, I'll call it. How's that? Yeah, sure. Well, there's a, a Q&A here okay. uh, in the Q&A. So um, I'll read out the question. It's from Michael Yee, who's asking uh, whether I can comment on the non-competitive relationship between memory and prediction-based frameworks. And he's comparing that to the apparent antagonistic relationship in language modeling between different architectures. These are different AI systems. Uh, the LSTM artificial, which is a recurrent neural network system versus transformer based architectures, which and, and uh, transformer based architectures are the kind that I actually was, was showing with GPT-2 and GPT-3. And so I, this, I, I'm going to, I'm on the fly here and I'm, I had not thought of the parallelism that you're drawing attention to here between memory and prediction on the one hand and transformer and uh, LSTMs on the other. So, so both transformer and LSTMs are often trained as language models. That's a predictive system. Um, LSTMs incorporate information over time using kind of I mean, this idea of, fee of, of recurrence. So, so the state of the network feeds it next. So time is kind of built into the network. It's literally operating over time versus transformer where it sees the whole input and uh, it, it uses attention to approximate sort of what information from quote the past might be involved. So both have features of memory and have features of prediction. I mean, I guess that I see them as, I see those perspectives as compatible with the idea that those frameworks in sentence processing are, have not themselves been antagonistic. They might've been presented as such. Maybe that was just me misreading the literature, but they are not. They are two different frameworks for thinking about hmm. one larger, more uniform system. So that, that's as best as I can think of right now, but I'm afraid I'm not on, my, on the fly. I might not be getting at the details that you might wanna dig into. There's another question in the Q&A. John, did you want to take that? You want me to read it? And this is from Chow Wen? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Ch hey Chow Wen. It's late. Yeah, folks are coming in from Europe. It's late. Um, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, so um, I can explain. Do I want to? So so basically, <laughs> the way we want to cap, so what, as Chow Wen, you know, but as many of us know, that the way we want to think about the you make understanding how the how different components of, of a, any model, the, how we understand their unique contribution to some signal. So that signal now, is John, always... John, let me interrupt for just a second. Lisa popped in. and So let's repeat John, Chow Wen's question. So that oh, thank you, because folks can't see it. OK, <laughs> thank you. So Chow Wen asks, I wonder if you can explain more the residual between CCG and GPT-3, and I think if I'm right, this is a graph I showed where there was a graph of, of CCG, a graph of GPT, and then some graph called difference. And so I don't, 
really want to get into the details because actually I'm not super satisfied with exactly how that graph was computed. So there are multiple ways we can think about quantifying the unique contribution of a given element in our models. And that's challenging when models have elements that are kind of overlapping with each other in terms of how they capture a particular signal we're measuring. And the signal, of course, is a superposition of, of lots of things that are, the brain is doing simultaneously. So our modeling effort, we have to sort of decompose that superposition. And that's a statistical challenge. And um, the way I did it in that particular graph is, uh, I think, a first approximation. But I'd love to talk to you or others offline about where we're going next in that process, because we have some ideas moving forward. Okay, so everybody don't forget, you can also use the raise hand. So John, while people are getting ready, let me say, so you began with the pessimists. You ended as an optimist. So are the pessimists getting any more optimistic? Oh no, the pessimists have always been optimistic. They were just trying to rile us up. Okay. They were just trying to rile us up. I mean, I think that someone like M. Baker or Popa, they're, they're, they're still doing their own language. I mean, they weren't. Yeah, I know. But I think that's why I tried to frame it as, you know, this sort of critical thinking is necessary to, to just like, just to really assess like what is productive, what's more productive and what's less productive, which is why I, I had a lot of fun putting these slides together. Maybe that's why I went too long, too much fun. And, and for me to evaluate like, why, why am I optimistic? And is that, so whether it's justified or not, I tried to give it, I tried to make my case. Case well made. It's the end of the week. It's a Friday. Pe folks, are, folks are tired. John, it's a pre so I'm, I'm in the panel, so I don't, I'm not raising hands because I can't raise raise hands in the question and Q and A. Um, so since other people are not asking questions, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, first great talk. Really, really interesting. Very exciting. Um, so I wanted to ask you a question about the P six hundred and sort of especially coming out from the the work by Rachel. Um, so is, is there a sense here in that the P600 then is reflecting not how someone would integrate uh, the information in terms of specific, specifically the information in terms of syntax into their own grammar, but what they assess to be the um, expectations regarding someone else's grammar? Thanks, that's a really, a really great question. And so I think there are two points to how, at least I'm thinking about it. I certainly wouldn't want to speak for how Rachel's thinking about it. Um, one point is, is I definitely do think we still see the P600 as about integrating into grammar. So I, I, I'm strongly in favor of that very classical opinion about the P600. I don't think we've been knocked aside from that opinion. But the question you're asking is the second piece, which is, well, who's, what, what grammar? Or maybe whose grammar? And that is, I think, the interesting next question. I don't think we have an answer to that, to exactly what, who, I mean, it's, it's gonna be some grammar in you as the language receiver's head, but is it the grammar you use also when you produce, or have you made a model, perhaps an approximation of, of another person's grammar? And I think that Rachel's really probing deep in that, um, uh, Rachel and others on, on exactly that issue, but I don't, I don't know of the answer yet. Thank you. I'm just looking at chat and, okay, there's a question in the Q&A uh, from Doug Merchant. Um, Doug's asking, what is the status of the classical distinctions between Broca's area and Wernicke's area in this framework? Do we still think we can localize functions there and what about lateralization? Um, so broadly, uh, the my, my sense of, of where our work is, but where the field is also, is that kind of a, a yes and no when it comes to those classical regions. So in some sense, those classical regions are doing something involved in language. So whether it's inferior frontal gyrus or Broca's area and posterior temporal lobe or Wernicke's area, they are doing something when it comes to language. Now, are they doing what was attributed to them in the classical model? No. Uh, the the functional role of these regions, I think, has been heavily revised. Um, the, and the other thing that's happening and that we didn't see at all here is a, a perspective of, of moving away from a sort of characterizing 
regions at this sort of macro level of like, you know, four square centimeters of tissue up here compared to five square centimeters of tissue in the temporal lobe and thinking at, at a more finer grained level. And I didn't go there at all in my material today. But in terms of sort of, if we had to focus on where should our attention be in the brain, we can look anywhere in the brain, where should I look? Yeah, you would be well, it, it's, it's good to look in those same broad general brain areas when it comes to sentence processing, but with an eye towards, we got to get more precise once in, inside those areas. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, Lisa has her hand up. So Lisa? I think Maybe we need to. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. No. It took. It took like it was processing. Sorry. Um. Um. So yeah, I have a question. I'm going back to the residual. Um, the CCG. Um, and GPT three residual kind of comparison that Chowen was also asking about, but I have a different question about. You know, of course. You know, I know you know that <laughs> that uh the. The, what CCG is describing, the syntax is also going to influence GPT-3, right? So there's certain, you know, in there are many aspects of syntax that are going to be present in the GPT-3 prediction. So it's not like prediction versus syntax. The predictions are built off of the syntax of the language as it exists, right? So I guess I'm in terms of interpreting that in a like more complex way, does that you know, do you think of the residual as being, you know, associated with certain phenomena that are syntactic that don't fit prediction aspects of syntax, which are not very, you know, picked up in the frequency or, yeah, like what, what actually is that residual characterizing? Yeah, yeah, so good, so good. Um, so, so I really appreciate being careful not to pit prediction against syntax. That is a really great kind of thing to, to really be clear about here because they're not in opposition. And the parser, the, the very structural parser, the CCG parser, in fact, is making its own predictions all the time. So what is really different in those, in the difference that residual is about what we are quantifying when we quantify sort of what we think is effortful. So do we think it's effortful when you miss a prediction by more or less amount? Or do we think it's effortful to do some parsing work, like to build some structure? And so the, it's, it's the quantifying the model in terms of building some structure that that's how we measure processing effort in the CCG model. And it's, it's missing a prediction. That's what we measure from the GPT-3 model. And I guess GPT-3 is like the best estimator of when we might be closer, of what a human might be doing in, in, in getting closer or farther from a prediction. So it's a very good way to approximate when someone is, is making a, a successful prediction or, or an unsuccessful prediction. And so it's that way of measuring why, of what really counts as work, missing a prediction or building some structure. And I think there's still some work to be done to understand the building. So the brain we have, is building structure and that is effortful and we can measure it independent of whether you missed a prediction or not. As okay, John, John since, since, since no one is jumping in to ask questions, uh, I'll ask another one. Um, all right, so you, talk, you, you, you talked about the categorical grammar approach in terms of uh, providing a, a great account to deal with the incremental parsing there. Yeah. Um, so my question is more like with respect to sort of the broader perspective about like, so when we think about things like language acquisition processing is, to which extent are, are, are the things that are being found in those domains um, coming back to people who are thinking about theories and, and telling us, oh, this is the wrong theory. This theory does not work, right? Um, so in, in view of, of some of these things that you talked about, what do you think are the, the sort of a couple of relevant uh, points to come back to theoretical accounts to say, these are, these are right ways to go or not the right ways to go uh, considering results from from neurolinguistics research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is 
a hard question, and these are the good ones. <laughs> it's a good hard question. So, so one thing that I think is really important in guiding the way we've been approaching this problem, and especially kind of now that we're moving to the combinatorial uh, categorical grammar, is is recognizing a, a cross theoretical synthesis that is sometimes not very explicit in the field. So this is a synthesis that goes back to work by people like Mark Steedman, shown on the slide. Also, linguists like Ed Stabler, Thomas Graff at Stony Brook has been working in this domain, showing that um, at a particular level of abstraction, there's a lot in common across diverse theoretical frameworks. So these include subvariants of minimalism, whether you have remnant movement or rightward movement. This includes combinatorial categorical grammar. This includes uh, the tree adjoining grammars uh, developed by people like Aravind Joshi. Um, and, and there's a, I think, a consensus at, in, in terms of the explanatory, uh, the power, the strength of those grammars, and also their limits. You know, what kinds of rules can those grammars capture, and what can't they capture? There's a consensus of the kind of, of explanatory limits that you need for human language, and CCG is one such formalism that captures that limit. And there's a, a an equivalency class of these grammars. And so what I'm excited about is that we're finally getting our brain models into that equivalency class. Now. Are there differences between those equivalencies in terms of which one's the right one? Probably. And I think we're now ready to start thinking about how we want to ask that next question. But right now we're finally in the right equivalency class of a human-like grammar formalism. But we don't yet know how to tease apart which of those options is the right one. Thank you. And John, there's another question in the Q&A. So from Jackie saying, uh, thank you for thank you for the talk and then asking if prediction happens at the structural level or in a linear way. Thank you very much for this question. Um, so there are, I think, a co couple of different directions um, that that question makes me think about. One direction is something like, well, what are we predicting? Are we predicting kind of the next word or are we predicting sort of what structure this, this, this particular utterance kind of evokes. And I, I think that it's fair to say that we are predicting all of these things. So, uh, and that, I tried to capture that, in a, that very, that lightning look at that, in that graphic towards the end of sort of, we are activating memory representations, some of these predictively at multiple levels uh, uh, to, to guide ourselves in processing forward at the linear level and at the structural level. There's also some interesting evidence that, um, that, uh, and this might be kind of another aspect of what the question is getting at, that as we make these predictions, you know, there, there's a sense in which you could say, well, the, the words I've encountered, they motivate a particular structure, and that structure, I'm gonna, that, that structure is sort of the correct structure for capturing what's coming next. There's some evidence that uh, relationships between words that are not necessarily captured in that structure also guide further predictions. So I'm thinking of work by people like Christian Broadbeck, who's now at, at University of Connecticut, showing that, um, if I want to measure predictability uh, of a next of a, a next word, the the better estimates of how humans make predictions include the structure of the previous context, but also include the linear order of previous words. And one or the other alone reduces the fit of the model to the predictions humans are making. So it seems like both linear and structural predictions are in effect, and um, that I find very interesting and um, compatible with lots of frameworks of how we think about these predictions kind of activating multiple levels simultaneously. Okay, thanks, John. And there is another question in the Q&A uh, from Xiaohua saying, interesting talk. I wondered to what extent prediction is categorical or gradient. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I, I want to think about um, maybe multiple ways that things that that question evokes for me. Um, one is about sort of whether we are like, are, we have predicted something or we have not, is it a yes or no? And I, I, I do not think that, I, I don't, I think that we predict things, you know, in a gradient way. So something can be more predicted or less predicted, whether we want to think about that in terms of some sort of Bayesian calculation of probabilities or whether some of competing and activation levels, these are different frameworks for thinking about, yeah, things are more or less predicted in a continuum. But what is being predicted? Well, that's going to be a, a mental representation. And I, I think those representations are, are best understood categorically. You might be predicting a particular syntactic feature, a particular lexical feature, a particular phonetic feature. 
a particular social index. So that the, act, the, the memory representations that are being predicted are being activated, I think of those as discrete representations, though their level of activation could be gradient. I hope that gets at sort of where that question, that interesting question is going. Thanks, John. Yeah. Right. Um, any last questions for John? We're, we're getting close to our time anyway. Um, and also, I, John, I wanted to thank you not only for a terrific talk, but also for engaging in the way in which your lab has been working with, you know, our graduate students over the years. And so it's a, it's a- well, All, it's a all I can do is advertise for what these, these wonderful people are doing. And I'm just lucky to be able to work with them. Yeah. Yeah, I think we all feel that way. So any last questions for John? All right, so let's all thank John. Thank you all. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and then let me just ask, uh, Crisi or Loretta, are there any last announcements we should make? As everybody is thanking John. Um, so we'll have, um, we'll, we'll have a get together at 6 p.m. Right, starts at 6 p.m., 6 to 7. Even if you can, if you cannot join right away, join anytime. Uh, it's just for chatting, for people to get to talk to people who they didn't talk to or to say bye and uh, uh, talk a little bit more to anyone. Um, and I, I'm on cell phone, on the cell phone here. Can, uh, Loretta, can you put the link to the, to, to the um, a Zoom for that meeting? Um, can you put it up on the chat so that people can have it? But it's, uh, it, um, it's being sent out over email. We can send it out again. And um, I mean, I, I'm gonna say this there, but I wanna already say for people who may not join there, I wanna thank everyone who was involved in this because indeed everyone in the department had their hands on deck in terms of doing this work and uh, organizing this, but especially the graduate students who put in so many additional hours this week, meeting with our guests, um, hosting them, um, organizing the individual meetings with them, the faculty who had uh, held meetings with the students, um, um, Yelena and Jan on the background who did all the um, work uh, with um, other support from the staff. So really, really everyone, thank you very much for all the work that you have put in. Um, and I hope you join us for an hour. If not, uh, we'll be hearing from you, you'll hear from us. Um, we'll be in touch. Uh, thank you. And the link for the party is now in the chat. Just oh, thank you. All right, thank you everyone.